Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. I'm here with Mark Mazurowski. Mark Mazurowski is the brains behind the Mazworks brand. He's got a lot of experience with the SR20 engine and he's gonna help us screw this SR20 together today. Mark, can you give us a brief history of your career with the SR20 engine? Well, my first time seeing SR20 was when I was stationed in Japan in the late 90s. I had a few friends with them. I didn't personally have one. I actually started off with a CA18. And then when I came back to the US and I started my company, Mazworks, I decided to continue working on the SR20 and progressing it in motorsports. You guys can paint a drag race vehicle. How fast has that vehicle gone with an SR20? We first started off with the SR20 DET in, in like a street form and we raced in HRA. We went low nine seconds. This is probably mid 2000s. And then we finally evolved into like using a full chassis S15 and we've gotten down to the uh, 622 at like 226 miles an hour with it. Wow, very impressive for a four cylinder engine. As far as the short block, we have a Brian Crower connecting rod. We have a Wiseco piston. We're gonna use a set of ACL bearings. We've got a brand new crankshaft. The crankshaft that came out of the engine, the thrust was wiped out on it. So we've got that, we've got a Mazworks head stud kit. Everything has been machined and cleaned so we can just screw it together. This is a Mazworks stage two block. So can you run us through some of the things that a customer gets when they buy a Mazworks stage two block? Yeah, yeah, like, like Jay said, this is a, our stage two block prep package. What we originally need from the customer is a good virgin core block so we know what we're starting with. From there, we break the engine down, we blast it, we clean it, we start fresh with the casting. And then we, threw, we run it through a few CNC processes. Our biggest things you can actually see is the, the threaded freeze plugs and the threaded oil port plugs. We do that because we've had a lot of problems with the, um, pulling in and out um, steel freeze plugs and scoring it up so they tend to leak a little bit plus it's a good thing to see on the block and we go through we sleeve the block um, we line bore it we cut the caps down bring it back to spec and there's also some modifications through the mains it looks like you guys have resurfaced the main saddles before you align bore and that's a good thing to do because if you're dealing with any deformation you want to make sure that you have a flat main saddle before you start and this is an aluminum block so you're going to deal with some mm -hmm. material moving around who makes that sleeve that you use uh that's a darton a darton dry sleeve i mean we rate our motors like if it's in a, in a racing environment so th this package we rate the, up to 600 horsepower right on this is a good resource for someone that's looking to uh, restore an SR20 platform and they just want to deal with a reputable guy, the guy that's got the most amount of success with that engine. They don't want to lose time and, and, and be part of someone's learning curve. They just want to go to the best guy for the job. They find their way to Mazworks. They buy a block, whether you're going to do a sleeve block or a non-sleeve block. It is up to you to supply a good core, but these guys can give you a block that is going to be a reliable package, which is what this project is all about. This is a restoration project. It's a, a guy my age that just wants the car he wanted to have when he was a kid, and we're just going to be a part of supplying him with a reliable engine program. So we also got a cylinder head done through Mazworks. Uh, it is a 0.5 stage. What, can you run us through what machining processes happen with that head and what parts you chose and why? Okay, this is our staged 0.5 head package. Um, what we do is we start with the, the factory casting and it's pretty much like an OEM plus. So we would just take it apart, disassemble it, deplug it, and we would put all brand new parts in it. We put brand new guides, valves, springs, retainers, valve seals, and we would go through and do all the machine work necessary to make everything fit. Um, we would also go through and, and, and shim it with, with the shims and guides to make sure the rocker's level so it's, it's ready and prepared for hydraulic cams. What also is included with all our head packages, we take all the Preston freeze plugs and we machine them for our threaded freeze plugs. As you can see here, there's four in the front and two in the back on the SR20 DET S13 head. Like these are the oil pour plugs that we go back through. Those four. There's some on the inside too, but at least if we talk about it, you can see them. Yes, even the little details, like we go through all the cam journals and buff the cam journals. I mean, they go everything, all the surfaces, we deburr them. I mean, we take it a, a little bit farther than a standard machine shop would, you know. So along with machining the saddles, before a line bore, Mazworks also uses their CNC machine and they machine this trough. So you've got a bearing that has multiple feed holes. So they're trying to keep this reservoir full 
as the crank is rotating, supplying oil to the rod bearings, helping them stay lubricated and cooled. And they've got this machine trough that makes sure that you can take advantage of the full flow available from the oil pump. So Mark, what's the difference between these two ACL SR20 bearings? Uh, the single hole bearing is a native bearing out of uh, a rear wheel drive SR20 DET. And the five hole bearing, it comes out of the, the GTIR, the Pulsar GTIR 54C motor. Actually, the five hole is an is a, is a earlier part. And I guess when they went to the rear wheel drive version, they just decided to stick with the single hole bearing. I'm not sure what the reasoning was behind that, but we upgrade all the motors that we build to the five hole bearing. And what, what did you see in your experience with the engine that the five hole bearing offered a benefit? Well, it definitely increased flow to the rod. And you can see the rod bearings handle more stress in the racing environment. That's how I started when I got to Japan. I was a V8 guy, you know, I went to mechanics class. I wanted a Chevy Nova. I got deployed to, to Okinawa. I had a friend pick me up in his S13. And from there is complete game changer. I mean, yeah. how fast the cars were for their time. No, the um, small displacement turbocharged stuff really put a lot of guys in our age demographic uh, kind of on their heels because you could get a lot of fun out of a small turbocharged engine versus dealing with uh, the more archaic um, American offerings, you know, with the V8s. So there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot of fun to be had with the small displacement stuff. Going back to that era of your life, what uh, what cars would you have scooped up and put in a little glass bubble if you uh, could? I mean, uh, any mid '90s Japanese car. I mean, when, when I was, I remember when I was leaving in 1999. That's when the R34 Skyline came out, and you can see them brand new in the showroom. Yeah. And the R32 Skylines, the GTRs were six, seven thousand dollars. And they were only back then they were only a couple years old. Huh. And I mean S chassis were I bought my S thirteen for two grand. Oh man. You know? I mean it was and typically guys that rotate, if they got really nice cars, you know, they're they get to the point where they're dying just to get rid of them. So you can scoop them up pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome to say uh, you know, back in my day, because I bought and sold quite a few uh, S14s, I would scoop them up and sell them. And back then, I could buy one for 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 1,500. Cars with dead batteries, you know? <laughs> and then the, when the younger generation started really scooping them up, that's when they dried up and then the prices got wacky. Are there any uh, engine speed related problems with this? Are these 7,000 RPM, 8,000 RPM, 10,000 RPM? Well, what when, do you got there? When, when we when we were racing these, it, you know, we, we run them up to 9,500 RPM and not really have any issues RPM base. It was just every time we would hit the, hit the anti lag or ignition cut or something, that's when I had problems. So how did you race the engine if that was uh, such an obstacle? Like you could lose a rock arm in the, in the staging lane? It, it, yeah, it was a matter of chance. There was no, nothing consistently we did would cause a problem. You know, we would go to an event and we would Qualify, no problems. First round, break a rocker arm. So, and we wouldn't change anything. You know, we wouldn't change how we had the anti lag, how we had the two step, nothing. It was just the gods decided when the rocker arms would come <laughs> off. What was the biggest advancement in this uh, in this um, engine? Like, what I mean, was the biggest single thing? Well, definitely the VE head. I mean, going to a VE head just. And what was your reasoning between uh, getting to a billet block? When did that happen? And why did it well, we, I mean, yeah, we obviously, we, you know, you start off with whatever parts you have, we would run the cast block, but you know, at 12 and a horsepower, you know, we would take the motors apart after an event and you can just see the caps falling out 
and just the line wasn't straight. And you can see, you know, yeah. the, the block wasn't cracking yet, but it was showing signs of of abuse. Yeah. So we've got the short block together and now it's time to move to all the auxiliary systems that are gonna go onto the short block. And Mark has a treasure trove of all the parts that I need to get this finished uh, because he is an SR20 specialist. I didn't have to go hunt anything down. So it's all here, ready to go on the engine. And the first part of the build will be in, is installing the timing chain kit. The 20, 30 year old timing chain kits came with a plastic fixed guide, whereas the newer ones come with a, a full steel. The adjustable one is, is virtually the same. Possibly the plastic is, is newer, but it's virtually the same. New timing chain right there. We're gonna um, install our extended oil pump drive due to the fact that we don't need it for this pump, but since he's gonna go with the 60 minus two crank trigger, our pulley's already machined for the VE pulley. So we're gonna go with the extended collar and a new timing chain sprocket. And you also have this uh, mechanical tensioner here. Yeah, Tell me a little bit about that part. Yeah, this is something we developed years back. Um, it replaces the hydraulic tensioner, which is obviously hydraulically controlled, and a lot of the older ones had a lot of issues. So we decided through our racing program is to make a mechanical one that we can adjust ourselves. And we started to, to manufacture these in house, and we do it completely in house right now. This is a successful part, been out in the field for a while. How many of those things do you think are out in our operation? We probably sold 2,000, 2,500 of these wow. easily. That's a nice part. Very cool. Okay, and you also have a bolt kit. So we had hardware that had been spray painted uh, because it looked like the person that made the engine before had just like put it together and then spray painted everything black. So all the hardware was kind of looking. So Mark has supplied a new hardware kit. So we'll have all fresh hardware on the outside of the engine and all the little bits holding uh, two components to the engine block. Is this a factory piece, Mark? No, this is a, this is an oil scooter we manufacture in house. The factory one, is pressed in and as we refurbish the blocks and pull them out you know we, we lose the press on the block so we originally we would put brand new and factory ones in and they would end up popping out okay so that gave us an opportunity to create an aftermarket one something a little bit better to where this one actually threads in you have to tap the block but it threads in and it's a little bit longer to where it's a little bit it's close to the front cover so if it ever does decide to try to screw out it would it's hit just bottoms on the front cover. Correct. And, and this has oil jets in it? Yeah, the oil holes spray the sprocket, the chain, and keeps everything on the bottom end lubricated as far as the timing chain set. That's cool.
All right, this is a bleeding lifter of air. So Jay's putting a piece of welding wire through the top hole and releasing the check valve and pumping it to get all the air bubbles out of it. Well, if you don't do it and you have the air in it, it'll take some time to get the air out of it and it's gonna cause the valve train to be very loud. And a lot so of tapping noises. It makes people, it, like, it, it, makes, people it nervous. makes people nervous. Yeah, yeah. Cause you have to start your brand new engine up and listen to the valve train clatter and it does not sound good. So yeah, we, we actually bled these probably what, two or three months ago. Yeah. And just from being in the bag, you can see it accumulated some air. So it's best to do it immediately right before you install them. Mark, I see that you have these labeled. So what is the reason for them being labeled? Well, they have a particular position in the head um, you can see one is basically just a factory, a shim, like a hockey puck, and one has a slot in it. The one with the slot locates the rocker and makes sure it doesn't move side to side. That one tends to, that one from the factory is three millimeters. You can't really buy any other ones, the other thicknesses. Um, the other one is an adjustable shim to where you would want to get the rocker pad even with the cam so there's no uneven wear okay. during operation. Okay, so just it's insurance to get the rocker arm to be level in the engine. So Correct. The heel of the cam goes onto the take-up ramp, starts to actuate the rocker. It's got the whole footprint or the design shape of the rocker and the design shape of the cam interacting correctly. Correct. Okay. That's it. So that's your move right there. That's it. Okay. Now we're gonna to move to the oil pan, but Mark had brought up a good point earlier in the build. He said that we should move to this other style pickup tube that the pickup tube that is in this configuration is prone to cracking and believe it or not, there it is. So if I grab this thing and spread it open, that's just kind of one of those things. So this one has an attachment point on the head of the pickup itself so it's supported it's not out there vibrating and it's just another oem nissan part that mark has supplied with the build
Another upgrade that this engine is getting is a Mazworks crank trigger kit. So this is a Mazworks damper. It's got a 60 minus two pattern and it comes with a Mazworks bracket that houses a race grade or MoTeC sensor. So you have a small air gap there. It's like 12 thousandths to 25 thousandths. We've set it right in the middle of range around 16 thousandths. That's the distance from the tip of the sensor to the top of the tooth. And what this is gonna do is give us exact crankshaft location. So as engines have evolved, most OEM engines have moved to a crank trigger setup where this from the factory had a CAS, it had an optical sensor that was integrated with the crank position and the cam position, but it was driven off of the camshaft. So we're gonna rely on a CAS tile sensor for the camshaft position for sequential injection, but all of the crankshaft position is gonna be done with this Maxworks kit. So Mark informed me that there's two different camshaft applications and the camshaft is drilled for two different setups. So if you have an S13 or an S14, it could be the same camshaft. So he's brought Miguel over. Miguel is the head engine builder over at Mazworks. He's gonna degree the camshafts in because each camshaft will have a different setup in this particular engine. So Mark, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, we're running the BC stage two cams and then BC sets their cams up so you can use them in S13 and S14 motors but there's a big difference with the S14 motors having the VTC. Typically, the intake cam will be retarded naturally about 16 degrees from the factory. So the VTC would, would, increase, would advance that cam based on the engine conditions. So these cams most likely would be at retarded 16 degrees. So we'll degree it initially and see where it's at and we'll probably have to advance it for an S13 application. Dead. Yeah, Jay. Didn't pump enough. Or it's dead. One of the two. I mean, dead. So the other day we pumped the lifters up before we put them in, and um, apparently there's a bunch of quitters. <laughs> they just died. It hasn't even lived yet. Well, that lifter's probably 30 years old, man. That lifter needs to get it together. I'm 45. Still showing up. To have a talk with your lifter, Mark. Well, at least it'll give you some uh, practice building SRs. The, the trials and tribulations of building SRs and the lifters. It just needs some oil pressure. Yeah, well, you could, you could revive it. I mean, since you're dealing with a hair, start it up, if it doesn't go away, then. Yeah. Did you flip over the ending, put it back yeah. on? Yeah. Oh, that was the, oh, that was the and you, okay. And you left it like that, right? Yeah. It was upside down at some point. Yeah. Well, well, we, did we leave it there long? No. Uh, at something. the end of the day. It was upside down. For a while, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that's the that, 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 Okay. It. Yeah, you can't leave much. I totally forgot about that. So if you flip your Nissan engine car <laughs> over in a ditch, it's best <laughs> that you get it back on its tires quickly so the lifters don't bleed down. Pretty much. Yeah, so on the Toyota, we just, we don't deal with these problems. <laughs> these are, these are the, these rock arms falling off and having to chase down, you know, <laughs> this or that and have to call Japan for an oil pump. We just we don't deal with it. So another thing that the guys at Mazworks do is they prime the engine before it leaves. So if you're purchasing a long block, uh, you know, cause these are the guys that get an SR20 from, before they create the engine, they put oil in it and they spin it with a high torque electric motor. And that's going to prime that oil pump, prime the whole valve train. The engine will be totally primed and ready to start. And this isn't a um, unheard of procedure. Like when I went to the Ducati factory, this is how they do all the motorcycle engines. They run the engines with an electric motor. 
they understand the drag of the engine right then. Everything's primed and ready to go. It goes in a motorcycle, gets dynoed, and leaves the factory. So this engine won't be dynoed before it leaves here, but it will be primed and ready to fire. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It's been a neat process for me to be able to work so closely with a guy that I've known for a number of years. You know, Mark Mazurowski has been in that Nissan community, hardcore, SR, RB, and he's, you know, bringing a lot of that tribal knowledge to this build. So if you're just looking for pistons and rods, you can order them from Real Street. If you're looking for a complete SR engine, you can get one assembled through Mazworks and get all of that knowledge applied into your build and you can just have a trouble-free, fun little engine to enjoy. So different process for me because I'm normally the one doing it and this time I got to bring uh, some new talent in and mix it up on an engine that I don't really get to work with on a regular basis. So I think it's a great looking piece. Everything's done right. The owner will enjoy this engine for years to come. It's not going to be super powerful, but at four or 500 horsepower will be a very fun little engine to enjoy. So I hope you've enjoyed the process. You know, for me, neat to look at an engine that I don't work on on a regular basis and be able to see the ins and outs of what makes it different from say the Toyota platform or the Honda platform because Nissan is its own breed. And all these different engine manufacturers are just that, they're their own breeds. So get to see something different, work on something different and have some fun in the process. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'm interested to know what you think about the SR20 engine. SR20 engine in Mark's world has been a drag racing piece and they've gone really fast with it, but in the drifting community, it was an essential component in that culture as it grew here in America. Turbocharged, rear wheel drive, affordable, fun, Japanese engineered platforms. They landed here in the States and everybody started sliding them around. So if you have experience with the SR20 or if you're looking to build an SR20, we'd like to hear from you. We hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.